All right, I'm very happy to be joined by Donald Farmer. Uh, today, we're going to be discussing Beyond Analytics from Prediction to Action. Uh, and just to give a, a quick bio, uh, Donald is internationally respected speaker and writer with over 30 years of experience in data management and analytics. He advises investors, software vendors, and enterprises on data and analytics strategy. His consultancy, TreeHive Strategy, has developed a process known as the Game Plan, which enables enter enterprises to map out an effective step-by-step -step strategy for developing a culture of analytics and data literacy. Customers have included significant players in manufacturing and financial services. In addition to strategy, Donald frequently consults on governance and compliance issues, particularly for companies implementing self-service architectures. His workshops on innovation strategy have helped to drive significant changes in numerous businesses. Please welcome Donald Farmer. Thank you so much for joining me today. Well, thank you very much, Andrew. It's great to be here. I know I just gave you a little bio there, but uh, would you mind maybe drilling down a little further into your expertise and what it is you do? Yeah, you know, for the last sort of seven years, I've been consulting and advising. I'm really a product guy. You know, I build products. That's what I really enjoy doing. So I was at Microsoft for 10 years and built products there. And went to Click for seven years and helped to build a second generation product um, at ClickSense. Um, but now I'm independent and I get to work with all sorts of companies, you know, and um, product companies are still my favorite, you know, software vendors. That's what I really enjoy doing. But in order to keep you know, in touch with enterprise, I also do quite a lot of enterprise consulting, mostly strategy advising. Um, and, and that's a lot of fun as well. And my clients are, you know, global or absolutely worldwide, everything from a uh, kitchen cabinet maker in uh, Denver to a fashion incubator in Singapore, which wow. you might be surprised by, um, <laughs> you know, all sorts of things. So, Very cool. Yeah. So the topic today, beyond analytics from prediction to action, can you maybe expand a little bit on, on exactly what that topic pertains to? Yeah. You know, one of my big concerns um, with analytics as, um, as I see it in, in, in industry when it's gone live is that we spend a lot of time analyzing, but not necessarily a lot of time tying that analysis into the actions that need to follow. And, and, and that's a real problem, actually, because, you know, analysis just as situational awareness is actually quite useful, but it's only really impactful when we start to take actions that are informed by the analysis. And um, for too long, we've spent uh, a lot of time building analytics, building dashboards, building reports, but not focused on what people will actually do with that. And, and I think, especially, you know, if we're in an economic downturn and money is tight, people need to have better informed actions, not just better information, but better informed actions. And that's what I, I really focus on. Terrific. Um, so as you just alluded, a lot of your work is fo focused on decision making, uh, but it sounds like there's, there's a human component and a machine component here. Uh, why is it important to have both of those? Right. Well, you know, one of the, you know, I'm not actually this old, okay? <laughs> but, you know, back in the 1940s, 1950s, there was a term that emerged um, as people started to build mathematical models of business, and they called it decision support. What are the models we can build that support better decisions? And we're all kind of familiar with that term, decision support systems. And then, you know, the marketing people get to it and the technology advances and it became, you know, reporting and it became enterprise information systems, executive information systems. And then it became things like, you know, business intelligence and then self-service. And then well, now what, is, what is it today? Decision intelligence is the latest. Ultimately, it's still decision support. It's still that term from 1940s and 50s. <laughs> we are supporting people in making better decisions. But there is now, of course, increasingly automated decision making. Right, where software robots or software driven processes can to a certain extent perform what used to be human decisions. So there is a very strong human element, especially when you're talking about tactical decisions about the direction of the business or strategic decisions about you know the future of the company. But a lot of operational decisions, so smaller decisions that we make can actually be automated because the human element was important once, but you can scale it with machines in a way that you couldn't before. And that gets pretty interesting. That is very interesting. Um, continuing on the theme of decision-making, have you seen, I'm, 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 I'm assuming it's relatively obvious, but the difference between how humans make decisions and how, how machines make decisions and why those two things uh, can play off of each other, maybe? Yeah, so of course, one of the important things about human making a decision is that a decision in human terms is always a choice between outcomes. You know, we know what potential outcomes are and we choose 
you know, do I do this? Do I do that? And there's always, if the choice is obvious, it's not much of a decision. Mm. You know? right. It doesn't feel like much of a decision because it's so clear. So what human beings are really good at is when the decisions are unclear. And what the choices are unclear, we can we can bring in all sorts of other factors which aren't actually necessarily in the data. Mm. So if you sit around um, a board meeting, you sit around a sales meeting, and you listen to people making decisions in that meeting, um, a lot of what they bring to the table is actually not in the data. It's their experiences, their their prejudices sometimes, mm. good and bad. It is their hopes, their ambitions. All that feeds into the decision-making process. And also their understanding of the economic environment, the social environment, the individual characters of the salespeople or the managers who are involved. All of that comes into the decision-making process. Now, obviously, in a machine-driven process, none, none of that is there. Right. The machine doesn't understand or care about any of those things. Yeah. So the human process is very human, and it brings in a lot of these other experiences. But then that's a slow process. What machines can do is make decisions really quickly, almost instantly. You know, you apply for a loan. You don't have to beg with your bank manager and explain your entire life circumstances. You get a loan or you don't because it's an automated process. Now, that allows you to do something very different. It allows you to scale. You can now do thousands of loans. And because you're doing thousands of loans, but you just couldn't do it in a human process, you can start to play the risk of that. And you can start to handle risk differently. If you can start to handle risk differently, you can handle your capital differently. If you can handle your capital differently, you can handle your treasury and your debt differently. Mm. And so it actually frees up not just the decision-making process, but the entire business process behind that because you're working at, with such speed. And what that does, I like to compare it to um, a movie. Yeah. Yeah. A movie is a series of still photographs running at 24, 25 frames per second, depending if you're in the USA or Europe. And um, what's interesting about that is it's still still photographs, but when you run it, something else, something different happens. Mm -hmm. Still photographs have a lot of information in them, and you can scan the photograph, and you can pull out that information. A moving photograph, what you're actually doing is you're picking up the movement itself. Mm. It was said that when the first movie was ever made of you know, the train coming into the station, that people in the cinema screamed and ducked under the chairs. Out of the way, right? <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't do that with a still photograph. So, now, what's that got to do with decision making? Well, when you make decisions so quickly and, and do that so with, with an automated process, it becomes more like a movie than a still photograph. Mm. Rather than being something that you contemplate and consider, it becomes something where the movement and the motion becomes important. So the process speeds up enormously. You've got to be careful that you're not speeding up a bad process. You know, sure, hey, we can course. make bad decisions really quickly. It's like <laughs> not a great business scenario. Right. So you, know, you need to have confidence in the decisions. Mm. Um, but at the same time, you can speed them up tremendously. And that transforms the entire business. It's not just about making decisions more quickly, but all that other stuff that I mentioned feeds into that as well and is approved by that. I really like that analogy. The, the, that really helps paint a picture for those that aren't necessarily familiar with the process that you're discussing here. Um, so, you know, technologies, when we when we move into that realm, um, do you think uh, for data visualization as an example, do you think it's important that humans need to support better decisions? Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting with, so visualization is yeah. a very human capability. Right. You think about like a scatter plot, you know, there's some outliers on the scatter plot. We can instantly see that. You show you show somebody a trend graph, they can instantly see the trend. Mm. You almost don't need to interpret it. Right. There's a very, very basic understanding required because we're so attuned in our nature to 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 visual interpretation. Right. You know, we're 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 we're, we're kind of carefully tuned to pick out the outliers, to pick out the strange things happening. The example that's always given is, you know, you have to be able to spot the tiger in the grass, you know. Of course, survive, of you know? course, yes. So so we have this strong visual sense, and that's one of the reasons that visualization is so compelling to us. Um, but visualization has to work with you as well. So the visualization has to be carefully designed to meet, you know, the human requirements. So we are sitting here in our, right now in Orlando, while well, we're filming this, mm. and there's a hurricane, or at least a tropical storm, possibly <laughs> a hurricane approaching. Right, we'll see. We're all worried. We're all watching <laughs> the diagrams. We're all watching the code as it as it comes in. Yeah. Many of those visualizations are terrible. You and I are trying to make decisions. What do we do about? Well, literally, we're making decisions. What do we do about our flights? I changed my flight already, yeah. you know, based on on that information. Mm -hmm. But actually, even for me as a data specialist and as a visualization specialist, looking at some of those 
illustrations in the local news channels. They're terrible. <laughs> they don't actually help me make a decision at all. <laughs> Some of them are better than others. Sure. Um, because they're not focused on decision making. Mm. They're, some of them are designed, especially the television ones, are designed to be really kind of pretty and, and, right. and, and attractive and nice visualizations. But I've got a decision to make. What do I do about my flight tomorrow? And, and that decision needs very specific information, which is actually quite difficult to get from some of those visualizations, which are giving you general background information. Mm -hmm. So if we focus our visualizations on what decisions are going to be made by the person looking at this, that actually is a different visualization compared to, am I trying to give somebody a general picture of what is happening? And a lot of our business intelligence visualizations have been focused on giving people a general picture of what's happening rather than on the specific decisions that will be driven by this. That makes sense. And I, it sounds like that could be something that companies can drill down deeper into, right? Right, like, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, they should be able to. Yeah. And, and so this brings up a nice, I think, a good point on collaboration. Uh, working between human and machine, uh, when we don't make decisions on our own, mostly we collaborate as human beings, we decide as a team, how can analytics potentially help in this realm as well? Yeah, so this is important because um, human beings don't, mostly we don't make decisions entirely on our own, especially right. in business. Occasionally, you know, you'll get the, um, the the boss who wants to make the decision entirely on their own, you know, <laughs> who, want, who wants to work for them? You know, this, this, most of our decisions are collaborative mm -hmm. and, and interactive and at least involve information from other people. Business intelligence tools have been pretty poor up until recent years on collaboration. And so one of the things about that is imagine any business intelligence tool that you know, any one that you have deployed, any one that you've played with or used, and, and, and think about how you found some information in that. Oh, I did this filtering and I applied this kind of selection and I, I, I chose this piece of data and now I found a really interesting nugget of information. Okay, now what? What do you do with it? <laughs> and the tools don't have anything for you to do. What do I do with this nugget of information that I've discovered? And, and if that's what happens in the tools um, and you can't take that information and collaborate with somebody else on mm. it, share it in the most basic way that the tool has only taken you half the journey of, of, of the analytic process. It's taken you only up to the point where you've discovered something. Right. But it doesn't help you do anything with that discovery. So what we really need to see in business intelligence, and, I, and I'm, I'm grateful to see that it's happening. You know, mm. the tools are developing these capabilities. We are able to take it just a few steps further. Um, we're able to share some of these insights. But are we still able to collaborate on some of these insights so that somebody can come back and say, no, but I've got, I've got an alternative selection. Mm. Let's, show, let's show us alternative facts. Mm. Let's show us something else that I that, that I think is my interpretation. And then we can have a conversation. No matter, we might have an argument and discussion about it. Sure. And that will drive a decision. So it's super difficult in business intelligence tools right now at the moment to have that kind of genuinely interactive collaboration. It's getting better, but we're not there yet. We're not at the point where the business intelligence process is completely fluid and runs through the entire decision-making process from conception to discovery to collaboration to action. Got it. Uh, well, it sounds like there will be some developments made there in the coming years. I'm, I'm excited to see. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, they're definitely coming. Yeah. yeah. Um, I guess in a, in a sense here, I know we're short on time, so I'd like to wrap it up. Uh, if you were to perhaps give some advice for people that are starting to explore this topic in their own work, what would that advice be? Don't focus on tools. Mm. That's the primary thing. You know, people think that you, um, the, the tool choice is the important thing. Um, tool choice is useful, but only once you've actually developed your strategy. So you have to in, think about two things. First of all, how do you develop a data-driven, data-literate culture in your organization? That is worth more than any number of tools. We can, honestly, we can do everything in Excel if we're data literate enough. Sure. But most people aren't, so they need tools to help them. So you don't focus on the tools, you focus on that data literacy and that strategy. And then the second thing, of course, is focus on decisions. When you are working with tools, when you are working with visualizations, when you are working with machine learning, what decisions are being driven by that? And then the rest will follow from that. But the decision isn't something that comes at the end of a process. It is what you're driving towards. Yeah. And and, and that really needs a, a different mindset. Very cool. I would uh, I would ask if you could share some uh, ways that people can connect with you if they listen to this and they'd like to engage further or if there's upcoming 
events or anything like that that you have going on, would you mind sharing with everyone? Sure. Well, there's um, you can always find me at my website, which is um, treehivestrategy.com. Um, I have a, a blog called um, Creative Differences, which is creativedifferences.substack.com. I guess you can find me on Twitter as Donald Tree, Treehive. Um, and, and yeah, those would be the main ways to contact me. Terrific. Donald, thank you so much for your time today. It's been a great pleasure. Really enjoyed the conversation. And uh, yeah, we look forward to having you on again soon. Yeah, thanks thank very much. Yeah. Yeah, good luck with your flight. Thank you. Yeah, same to you. Yeah, exactly. Cheers. Thanks.